A word of warning. This podcast explores graphic and disturbing stories and includes some strong language. It therefore may not be suitable for our young listeners or other folks who may find it disturbing. Hello and welcome to True Crime Daily, the podcast covering high profile and under the radar cases from across the country every week. I'm your host, Anna Garcia. And our cases this week, a TikTok celebrity uses her influence on social media to plead for help in finding her son's killer. Her son was gunned down on the eve of his 19th birthday at a local gas station. But first, A wife who also went in front of the TV cameras in Dallas begging for help to find the person who gunned down her husband has turned out to be the person police had been looking for. Police say that she was the mastermind who lied about being a victim of domestic violence, that she lied to get her ex-boyfriend to help her escape an abusive husband. All lies, say prosecutors. And the judge called her pure evil before sentencing her to life in prison for the murder of her husband. We are recording this on Wednesday, June 29th, 2022. Our guest today is Gerald Griggs, a friend of the show. He is a criminal defense attorney, a civil rights attorney, um, handling a lot of high profile cases. Gerald is based out of Atlanta, Georgia, and we are just so thrilled to have you back. How are you, Gerald? Doing great, Anna. How are you doing? And thank you for having me back. Uh, thanks, Gerald. Um, before we um, started recording, I just want to let everyone know, Gerald, you told us you're waiting for, an, for a phone call that may interrupt this podcast, which, of course, is totally cool with us because you all are, are working. Um, for those who do not know, Gerald represents the family and some of the victims in the rapper R. Kelly case. So R. Kelly's been convicted in a New York courtroom and today is sentencing. That's correct. He was convicted in the Eastern District of New York. Uh, He faces a life sentence. So I am awaiting um, a text message and calls from my clients. A couple of them are up there. Some of them are not, uh, but they are watching. And so just waiting to see what Judge Donnelly sentences Mr. Kelly to. And what was he convicted of? Because there have been so many cases with R. Kelly. This one was RICO. Uh, This was the RICO uh, and violation of the Mann Act in the Eastern District of New York. And so he faces a substantial amount of exposure uh, since he's been convicted. And today they've been doing the victim impact um, statements as well as the defense mitigation statements. And the judge will hand down her sentence. So uh, we are watching and waiting and, uh, you know, staying by the phone. It's interesting, you know, we're not going to get into this case, but just one more thing for for those of you who may not know the RICO statutes, generally those are applied to a form of organized crime, as if there is an organized way in which the crime was committed. And and the allegations against R. Kelly are that he um, sexually abused minors and women, uh, used his influence, those around him used his influence to um, silence those women, keep them in an abusive manner. Manner. These are all the allegations against him. So would that be an accurate summary? That's an accurate summary. He was charged and convicted of running a criminal conspiracy whose purpose was to traffic underage men and women. Uh, so he was convicted of that. And the judge is going to sentence him um, today uh, for those convictions. OK, well, we're going to proceed with the podcast. If you get a call or a text and you need to jump We'll pause and then hopefully you can share with us what the breaking news is on the sentencing. Okay. All right. So let's get to it, everyone. So pure evil. That is what the judge said about 49-year-old Jennifer Faith. No truer words have been spoken. Not only did she orchestrate her husband's murder, she's already pled to that, but she lied about being a victim of domestic violence. She pretended to be a victim. And this is what has me incredibly upset. It is already horrific to take another life, but we know how hard it is for victims to come forward. We know how hard it is for victims to be heard, supported, and get justice. So when you have someone pretending, making false allegations, it makes it so much harder and is another violation for every true victim out there. That's why I'm upset, Gerald. 
Absolutely. Anytime you use the criminal justice system in a manner that is deceitful and, and harmful uh, to the true pursuit of justice, that as a travesty. So uh, for this uh, young woman to to basically fake this story of, of abuse and to get her boyfriend to kill um, her husband uh, is just horrific when you think of it and, and the lengths that she went, uh, you know, sending um, Getty images of abuse uh, that she got from the internet and, 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 you know, making all this stuff up, but ultimately law enforcement caught on and, and ultimately brought her uh, to some semblance of justice. Yeah, she wasn't very clever because, you know, we talk about this a lot, the forensic evidence, we talk about the evidence in cell phones. And so she thought she was so clever. She deleted her text messages, um, all her history of phone calls with this ex-boyfriend who was a boyfriend back from uh, high school days. And so she even they even found uh, messages where she said, oh, I just reset my phone to factory settings. So this this woman thinks she's she's in the clear, but... Her alleged accomplice, who, by the way, has pleaded not guilty. This is the the boyfriend. Um, he has pleaded not guilty. He is charged, has not gone to trial yet. So we must presume innocence here. Police say that they found all of all of the text messages on his phone because he never cleared his history. <laughs> and they would have found it forensically anyway. Yeah. But there you go. Right. There you go. The forensically, forensically, they could have dumped the phone and gone through the phone uh, with uh, forensic experts to find all the deleted information, or they could have, you know, reversed um, checked her IP information and pulled the information that way. So people need to understand that the 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 um, technology behind all of this has has you know. Uh, proceeded so fast that they can do these type of forensic things. I was just in a trial uh, where they were triangulating a phone that had been dumped and a phone that had been spoofed and they actually were able to get the data off of that phone. Uh, so, uh, you know, criminals need to understand that uh, it's kind of difficult in this uh, new millennium to hide any type of digital evidence. Absolutely. And that was part of what did her in here. So we're talking about Jennifer Faith. Jennifer Faith pleaded guilty to interstate murder for hire in the death of her husband, 49-year-old James Faith, who sometimes went by the name of Jamie. So we may be using that a little bit interchangeably here only because we're going to be reading some text messages. So James, who worked for American Airlines as a technology director, was shot and killed while walking the dog with his wife, Jennifer, on the morning of October 9th of 2020. They were outside their Dallas home. This is probably the last moment in your day that you ever think something bad is going to happen when it's like 7 30 in the morning and you're walking your dog with your wife i mean that is just probably your least guarded moments i would think as a person who's always walking your dog <laughs> you know? um right okay so what's interesting thing is you know he gets shot and killed on this walk she does not she claims she's hurt a little bit we'll get into the details so ultimately in the very beginning gerald she's the key witness she's the lone survivor of this ambush so she from the perspective of authorities is immediately a key witness right absolutely she is the eyewitness and so you know authorities would go on what she saw and how she detailed the crime happening and you know it would be no reason for them to uh, think or suspect that she would have anything to do with this because she just witnessed a horrific gun violence incident where her husband was shot in front of her. So it would be no reason for them to think uh, that she'd be a prime suspect. So while she is the key witness in the beginning, not the prime suspect, um, because, of course, she survived this brazen attack. Ultimately, prosecutors figured out that Faith's boyfriend, Darren Lopez, who's 48 years old, was the gunman. Again, he's been charged, has not been tried yet. So police say that Darren shot James Faith seven times after driving to Dallas from his home in Tennessee, where he lived. Darren thought that he was saving Faith from a horrible situation. He believed that Faith was being physically and sexually abused by her husband. She sent him those images that you said she got off the internet to prove she'd been beaten. Um, she even set up a fake email account, according to prosecutors, pretending to be 
two people. She had two email accounts, one pretending to be her husband and then the other one pretending to be a friend. And so she would make up these abusive emails supposedly sent by the husband, which she then forwarded to the ex-boyfriend from high school. And then she had, as we'll get into it, she made up this friend and this friend then reached out to the boyfriend in Tennessee, Darren, and said, oh my God, it's so horrible what they're doing. You know, the husband is so abusive. Can you help? Again, setting him up. She, she really spun this web, an incredible it's, web. She set the whole stage. She created a, an immense story that is, you know, straight out of a, a fiction novel uh, where she is the damsel in distress and, and this man could come save her from this abusive relationship. And she did have a little bit of tech savvy to be able to create spoofed uh, email addresses that were communicating with each other to pretend to be other people and then to send them uh, to who would ultimately be the alleged uh, gunman. I just it, it blows my mind that she would go to this much detail to set something up like this. As I always say, isn't it easier just to divorce the person, honestly? And you cheaper. Know? And cheaper. A heck of a lot cheaper. There was some insurance money, apparently, that she had her eye on, and we'll get into that as well. But it wasn't a, it wasn't like a million dollars. Do you know what I'm saying? And not that I'm putting a price tag on a human being, but we've seen that when, you know, it, when the stakes are really high. There are no, no high stakes here. Just divorce the man, for heaven's sakes. Just, just be done just, with it. You know, get, a, get a divorce lawyer. Um, go through the process. Don't take another life and then ruin another person's life because they believe the lie. Yeah. Exactly. So I think to understand this and all the relationships going on, we always have to go to the beginning. I feel that when you go to the beginning and then you start seeing things unravel in real time for everyone, it starts making a little bit of sense. So here's the background. So Jennifer reportedly met James in 2005. Friends say that he fell madly in love with her and even bonded with Jennifer's daughter, Amber, who was eight years old at the time. So far, sounds like a really lovely man. So seven years later in 20. 2012, James and Jennifer got married in Las Vegas, and their relationship appeared to be very strong on the outside. In fact, James even legally adopted Jennifer's daughter, who had already turned 18 at the time, but yet he legally adopted her. What does that say about James, the victim, right? Yeah, it says he was trying to build a loving relationship and a family. He was supportive. He took in a, another person's child and was going to raise her as his own. I mean, he, he sounded like a very good person that didn't deserve the horrific manner in which he was killed. No, no, he deserved a better wife than this, that's for sure. The killing happened on the morning after James and Jennifer Faith celebrated their 15th anniversary together. Mm. Talk about timing. That to me always shows, you know, kind of the meanness and the nastiness, right? Yes. Timing, it's like, really? That's the day you're gonna pick? So the married couple, decided to go for a walk in the morning with their dog. This was 7.30 in the morning. This is when James gets shot and the killer got away in an older black Nissan uh, Titan truck. What's interesting here, uh, Gerald, is that our key eyewitness here, the wife, she manages to give a description of the assailant, even though he was wearing a mask and a hoodie and all this stuff. And it's interesting that it tends, she's very accurate because <laughs> later on when they do a lot of the catch security cameras, they see it really matches what he was wearing that day, which is interesting. However, she did not see or report the kind of vehicle he got away in. And it's the vehicle that ends up being very crucial to this investigation, which everybody else in the neighborhood saw and all the security cameras caught. Isn't that interesting how she just omits that part? Well, I mean, she wanted to give the right description, but she didn't want the person to get caught. So, you know, you have to make sure that your story fits what happened, but not get caught. So I think that's the part that, that caught her up. And she forgot that, you know, everybody has ring cameras. Everybody has surveillance cameras. It's going to be caught somewhere. And you have to, you know, think about these things um, if you're going to commit crime. And my, my advice is not to commit crime because everyone's watching. Exactly. I agree with you. It's getting harder and harder to get away with murder. Although, you know, I've had several profilers on the show who have given me statistics, something like 40% of people still get away with murder. But I think those numbers are decreasing. I think they're yeah, decreasing. They 
Okay, so let's get back to the scene of the crime here. So James was shot three times to the head, three times to the chest, and the final blow, one shot to the groin. That one was personal. Yeah, that was personal. That was that personal. Was, that was mean spirited there. That was that was a lot of uh, a pent up rage against him. Mm-hmm. That one was personal. But then again, the alleged shooter again charged. You know, has not gone to trial yet. Um, from prosecutors' perspective of what we know from the wife who's already been sentenced, he thought that this man was horrible and was being horrible to his girlfriend. So perspective, perspective Mm -hmm. on the storytelling and all the lies. So Jennifer was mostly unharmed. Uh, James died at the scene and the ambush happened on October 9th of 2020. So surveillance cameras um, did not pick up the license plate of that truck, but did get Mm -hmm. the truck. And what was interesting is the back of the truck on the driver's side, but back of the cab almost, picked up a decal, a letter T, which is apparently for the Texas Rangers logo, Mm. which is very specific. So now you know the make of the car with a very specific uh, decal on it, but we don't have the license plate. So this later will become interesting. Um, Police later will find text messages from Jennifer to the boyfriend telling him to take the decal off. Take the decal off because they're looking for a car with the decal. Oh, there you go. They'll never find him then. You know, they, they, you know, and depending on how long you had the decal on, there will be an outline of the decal if you take it off. So, yeah, that that's not going to save you from a, a potential murder charge. No, no. But the, again, they thought that they were more clever here. So naturally, Jennifer Faith, being the lone survivor here, talks um, through the events. And so she is telling officers that after walking outside the house, she says she heard footsteps coming up from behind them. And then she turned around and she saw a man with a mask pointing a gun at her husband. Isn't that interesting? If I'm walking the dog, Gerald, and I am all of a sudden surprised, how will I know that that gun is pointed at my husband and not at me? Would I not assume it's pointed at us? I would assume it's pointed at all of us because obviously the person wants to either rob or kidnap both of us. But yeah, that's a, that's an important distinction there. Isn't it pointing at my husband, not at us. So, um, you know, I would say ding, ding, ding that that's very weird. Um, she tells detectives this elaborate story, how the suspect attacked her by, um, putting duct tape around her hands and that the, the assailant started hitting her while she was on the ground that when she screamed for help, he ran amazing, but he never took anything from them, you know, like a cell phone, a wallet or keys. I don't know that they would have had anything while walking the dog and didn't break into the house. So what was the motive? What was the reason? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you have to typically have a reason for such a violent crime. So um, witnesses at the scene, though, described the truck and then they were able to provide with their security cameras really good images, but again, not of the license plate. And then police were able to match this truck as it proceeded and as the investigation proceeded. So um, I always think that when you, when we can play a clip of the people involved, it's the best, right? It really is telling. So this is a clip of the wife's interview with police, with police, her describing everything. And this was provided and released by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Let's play the clip. I turned around and I just saw this person shoot and shoot. several shots well a lot of shots uh 
six, five, six, maybe I feel like. Mm-hmm. And he just kept going. And I'm like, what is this stopping? <laughs> He said, his, your, your husband's facial expression? Just, just like, the life of God. And he just grabbed. And so I was like, the shot. And then I saw the birds just turn and like, just dark eyes and coming toward me. And so I started, I yelled, no. And I had the dog and I started to run. And he tackled me to the ground, to the ground, <laughs> and then stopped, and ran, and he's hitting my face. So there's a lot of crying going on there, Gerald. Also very telling when she says, "I didn't know him." Who says something like that? She was trying to be over dramatic, and it was a lot of bad acting. <laughs> yes. And we're not done with the bad acting, though, Gerald. We've got more for you. So not only is that a glimpse into what police had to deal with, but now Jennifer becomes very public. And she talks in front of cameras, does a lot of interviews with different television stations in the Dallas area, pleading for help to find her husband's killer. Um, She said she couldn't rest until her husband's killer was found. So I'm thinking she's resting really peacefully right now behind bars. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> it's just, she's it's sleeping just very well now. Yes, she's sleeping much better these days. Okay, so here's what she told Fox 4 News in Dallas. It's been horrible, devastating. I teeter between completely heartbroken and completely devastated every day. That was Jennifer Faith in October of 2020, talking to Fox 4's Sean Rabb, begging the public to help track down her husband's killer. I need that for closure. I need to make some sense out of this. Okay, Gerald, so she's teetering. I think she's teetering on the verge of being found out. She teetered on the verge of confessing to what actually happened. So, you know, that's probably what's playing in the back of her mind, that stress about they're going to figure out what happened. Mm, fascinating. I just love it when there's a video that we can put in in context with what's happening and how things are unraveling. And again, police will find that during these interviews, like even after she did this interview, <clears throat> she was sending um, clips of the news articles to her boyfriend in Tennessee, again, because of that T decal and the description of the truck kind of making sure he's updated on what's going on, you know, down in Dallas. Okay, so it didn't take long for police to figure out that there there was a lot going on here. First, they figured out that there were problems in the marriage. They asked, this is according to prosecutors, police asked if they could look at Jennifer's phone, and she said, sure. They, I don't believe they even needed a search warrant because I think she thought she was so smart she had deleted everything. She's like, yeah, here you go. <laughs> Mm. So uh, they ended up getting a search warrant for his once they mined hers for information. So according to Jennifer's phone records, police say that the couple, the married couple, hadn't had sex in years, um, were not particularly happy. She clearly was not happy. And then they found evidence that Jennifer was, quote, this is how it was described, having an emotional relationship with her ex-boyfriend from high school named Darren Lopez. It's very, they did find those in her phone. So then in April and May of 2020, Jennifer, um, now we're going back in time. She creates these fake emails that we said that she was posing. They start unraveling all of this. So here's an email that was sent to the boyfriend in Tennessee about a fake friend. This is all fake. Um, explaining how horrible Jennifer's husband is. Quote, Jamie. Remember, he's called Jamie or James. Jamie is abusing Jen today. Any ideas how we can help her? Question mark. (laughs) Darren Lopez responds, according to court records, quote, I know I won't feel better about her situation until she is out of the house away from him or she lets me put a bullet in Jamie's head. Now, given that he's charged at this point, Gerald, as a defense attorney, what do you make of this? 
Is that very incriminating? I mean, it's, it's quite incriminating. It can be explained away um, as, you know, banter and, and merely, you know, conjecture about talking about something that possibly could happen. But considering that he, the man was shot seven times, um, allegedly by your client and your client makes this statement before that, th- this is problematic. It is. Oh, and it gets more problematic. So um, police say that Jennifer had claimed that her husband was physically, sexually abusive, take, you know, building this whole case again with the photos. So authorities say that the ex who lived in Tennessee. So when I say ex, I mean, he's the one from high school and he's back in her life. So he lived in Tennessee and ran a furnace business and was having some financial troubles. Police say that his Tennessee home was 38 thousand dollars past due on the mortgage the bank had started foreclosure his water had been cut off because of non-payment so they're building authorities are building a case that this was partially um financial whether it means that jennifer took advantage of his financial situation you know and manipulated him both emotionally and also financially gerald i would ask you this since he hasn't gone to trial yet do her actions, which have already come out in court, do, are these things mitigating on his part? I mean, seven bullets and the man is dead. Are they mitigating at all that he was manipulated? Somewhat. I mean, it's not a justification for murder, but it helps to explain. I mean, if he was trying to negotiate, um, you know, down to manslaughter or something like that, it may come into play. But more than likely, what's going to happen is she's going to testify against him and all of this stuff is going to come out. So um, it possibly could mitigate, but probably not. Okay. Police say that Jennifer Faith had financial motivations herself. James had nearly $630,000 in life insurance policy money. Yes, that is a lot of money, more than half a million dollars. But again... Certainly, you cannot put a a dollar sign on a life. So Jennifer was the beneficiary. She attempted to collect after James was murdered, but the payment was delayed because the insurance company could not needed absolute proof from the police verification that she was not involved. And there are these text messages between Jennifer and the boyfriend in Tennessee about how, you know, the police detective said he would talk to the insurance company to try and help me out. Please, Mm -hmm. the police are playing you at this point, lady, because they're on to you. Mm -hmm. So definitely a lot of communication between the two suspects here about the money. Now, according to the criminal complaint, text messages later recovered through all of all of this, that, you know, Jennifer and Darren were constantly updating each other, not only on the case, but on the life insurance status, everything is detailed. You know, again, warning him to take that decal off. Here's the amazing amount of communication. Uh, Even though Jennifer deleted so much, police were able to forensically recover this level of communication through a warrant. 5,700, 5,000, nearly 6,000 phone calls and text messages between these two. Is that incredible? I mean, that's incredible. I mean, they absolutely told on themselves. I mean, they are the best witnesses against themselves. And to think that forensically they weren't going to be able to recover this information and use it against them shows a real lack of understanding of how sophisticated forensics has become. Unbelievable. It'd be one thing if they had just phone calls and no text messages, you'd say, well, they sure did talk a lot, but you wouldn't know what they talked about. But in the text message, we know exactly what the communication was about. Mm -hmm. It's really incredible. Police say that um, in the two days leading up to the murder, there were 600 communications. And then in the days after, 1300 communications i mean their phones were blowing up i mean did they ever not, were they ever not on the phone is the question no, I mean, they were on the phone 1300 i mean that's your your phone is literally on all the time yes there was only one period of silence and that was i believe like within 24 hours after um the murder except for one text this is my favorite text oh there are a few but i like this one <laughs> The boyfriend in Tennessee in the afternoon, remember, James is killed in the morning. He texts Jennifer to say, I'm home. I got home safely. Oh, he made it safe. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Is man, that that's incredible? A, that's a closing right. argument right there. 
He's mm-hmm. not worried about the young man that he just killed, but he made it home safe. He made it home safe. Unbelievable. All this information is in the criminal complaint. I mean, it's if you all want to read it, you have the time. It's something like 50 pages. It's fascinating. You know, I love reading court records. <laughs> so here's the other thing they found in Darren's phone. Apparently, Darren <laughs> used Google Maps <laughs> to get directions from his Tennessee home to the faith house in <laughs> Dallas. Do I need oh, to man. revive you there? Yeah, that one, I, I I don't know what to say. I mean, it's one thing to be pinging the person using the cell phone all the way on the trip, but now to have the Google Maps 3D version of the trip, yeah, um, I, I sense a plea coming here. <sighs> and they did, in addition to finding, you know, the, the incredible... Um, data showing his trip, they got the triangulation of all the pings as the cell phone was moving. So it's not like they're depending on one thing. They got that as well. It wasn't wasn't all that hard when you followed Google Maps. Incredible. So according to court records, Darren got to the Faith home about 2 a.m. So remember, shot about 7.30 in the morning. So he gets there early. <laughs> and then he waited in a neighbor's yard, and he's waiting for them to come out. So he's there for hours waiting. What he doesn't bother to realize is that one of the neighbor's ring doorbell's camera. He's recording gosh, all this. He's recording all this and him waiting. Ah, <sighs> Now, here's the other thing. So after police get a search warrant for Darren's phone, then they get a search warrant for his car, the car, the truck, and a search warrant for his home. According to the complaint, police claim that they have found the murder weapon, the 45 that was used. They claim it was found in Darren's house and shell casings were left at the scene. And authorities claim that forensically, ballistically, the two match. So now, according to authorities, there's a murder weapon. They found the smoking gun. Mm -hmm. So there's a heck of a lot of evidence, according to police, mm -hmm. that's stacking up here, really stacking up. Okay, this is the next part that I find most curious about this case. Back to Jennifer. Jennifer Faith creates a GoFundMe account for herself. This is the best, and she's got a great name for it. Are you ready, Gerald? I'm ready. Support for Jennifer Faith. (laughs) That's the name of the GoFundMe account. Support for Jennifer. Poor Mm. James is dead. Yeah. This kind man is dead. So she raises over $60,000 and she ends up withdrawing all that money to pay off her credit card debt and her bills. Uh, Police say that she bought Darren Lopez, the boyfriend, airline tickets, a television set. They claim they even, they're even pictures in the complaint of the big television in its box. Yeah, yeah. And the complaint, like I said, is like, reads like a movie. So, um she had even they claim police claim that they found credit cards in his possession that she had given to him so again financially supporting him and clearly he needed money but what's interesting is if you read the text messages it is really more emotional than it is financial because they're constantly professing their love for each other it gets really graphic and just gets like really stupid and raunchy which i'm not going to be repeating here um just stupid lines you know (laughs) like a really bad porno line (laughs) (laughs) all in text Uh, messages that we can all yes and follow (laughs) as we follow the google maps back to his house yeah absolutely oh boy do they have it all so Here's what ends up happening. In February of 2021, prosecutors charge Jennifer Faith with obstruction of justice, and that is based on the deleting of the phone calls and the text messages from her phone. And then in September, they added the charge of using interstate commerce in the commission of a murder for hire. That's why this is a federal case as opposed to um, a case being heard in a state court. This is the interesting part. Then police tell Darren, the boyfriend, she lied to you. She was not abused by her husband. Her husband never put a hand mm. on her. And he and, and they, they tell him, you didn't need to rescue her from an abusive relationship because there wasn't one. So then she doesn't stop. She doesn't stop. Prosecutors say she writes to Darren and says, the police are lying to you. 
it's not true. Because she didn't clearly, right? She's now has is facing charges. She doesn't want Darren to, to roll over, mm -hmm. right? And help the authorities convict her. So she she tried to convince him of that ultimately. And I think this is really important. At least it's important to me in this travesty. She finally admits in court and in writing that she lied about the abuse, that it wasn't true, that she fabricated it. And the reason I think that's important is because you've said some horrific things against the true victim here, the murder victim and his reputation and what his family has to hold on to. For a long time, his family was wondering, my God, did he really do this to Jennifer? So I think it's important to set the record straight that this man was completely set up in every way possible. Yeah, I mean, because he's not here to defend himself and ultimate lies got him killed. And so I think it is very important that his name be cleared and that people understand uh, the links that that she went to 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 um, accomplish this. And of course, the, the other young man is presumed innocent, um, but it's important that those facts come out. And I'm glad that it came out in open court. Yeah, I think it's very important as well. In February of this year, Jennifer Faith pleaded guilty to murder for hire in the death of her husband, James Faith. Jennifer was sentenced to life in federal prison. A judge also ordered her to pay $6,500 in restitution for her late husband's family to cover the funeral costs. And then a $250,000 fine. We'll see if she ever pays that off. But I, I think it's good that she has to pay back for the funeral, even if it's only... You know, I know it's not a lot of money, but it, it's about making this person pay in every way possible. Darren Lopez has been charged with the murder of Jamie, James Faith, and also a federal firearm offense. He has pleaded not guilty, and he is awaiting trial himself. So we'll see what happens here. Absolutely. Our next case is out of Alabama. This is where the son of a TikTok star who goes by the name Mama Tot has been fatally shot. The mother has taken to social media to plead for leads and for tips in her son's murder. Ophelia Nichols is best known as Mama Tot. She has 7 million followers on TikTok and she's considered a local celebrity in the Mobile, Alabama area. Her son, 18 year old Randon Lee was gunned down on Friday, June 24th at a gas station in Pritchard, Alabama. She made an emotional plea to all her followers in the area to please help. She said, you know, someone out there has got to know something, please. We have got to help find the killers. Now, you know, lots of mothers plead for their children, and we know that. And we also know that many of those pleas go unheard, and that is the injustice. And the reason I wanted to do this case is, you know, here is a mother who was fortunate to have a big platform where she could go directly and have impact in her community because a lot of tips all these tips police say started coming in right away even before police even identified publicly who the victim was so she took to social media before authorities even identified the victim of the shooting and so I think this case shows a lot. It shows the power of social media and going directly to people. It also shows how there is you know, if you don't have the access, that sometimes y you won't be able to reach people and tell your story. A and that, it, it hurts my heart for the mothers who don't have access like this and don't have a huge platform. Yeah, absolutely. And my heart goes out to her for the loss of her son uh, yes. and to the other mothers who don't have the ability to, to reach 7 million people uh, who have feel like they've developed a personal relationship with you. It's one of the things that people don't really talk about with social media. It's different from regular media because people feel like they've you know, developed a relationship with you through following you. And thus they are more inclined to listen to your call to action. So it's wonderful that she was able to reach so many people, especially locally uh, in Alabama, to start to care about that case and to start helping law enforcement to get leads. But I think people need to fully understand the true power of social media, the true power of having a platform, you know, that big to be able to help not only yourself, 
but others that may be in that same similar situation. Absolutely. And it's horrific. No mother, no mother should lose her child under any circumstances. And, and of course, I mean, you, you can hear and see the agony. We will be playing a clip in just a second, uh, a little bit more on the murder, because so far, at least at the time of the recording of this podcast, police say that they have two suspects who have not been named, but so far no arrests. So at the recording right now, things could change in in a few hours or a few days. So um, police say that Randon Lee was killed at a gas station on St. Stephen, Stephen's Road in Pritchard, Alabama. Police, again, didn't initially release the details and the victim's name. So on Monday, June 27th, this would be three days after Randon's death, authorities revealed a possible motive. Now here's the other thing. Now this, because it's happening on social media, it is now also, yeah, things are family, not family secrets, but family, additional family trauma is now being exposed because of social media, right? Mm-hmm. Um, it, it just is. So police say that the possible motive could be this. They claim that Randon may have been in the middle of a marijuana deal at the gas station. She and the family say they had no idea this was going on. So now you are, now these revelations are being shared more publicly because the door has been open to share these things publicly. It's it's like two-sided here. Mm-hmm. So many things going on. So authorities allege that Randon Lee and the two unnamed suspects met at the gas station. Police say that there is surveillance video that reportedly shows the suspects exiting their car and then getting into Randon's vehicle before shooting him and then leaving in a black SUV. So there is surveillance video, according to authorities, that give you that gives you that much detail. So they say that Randon Lee already shot, drove to another gas station across the street where he died from a single gunshot wound. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if he was trying to get away to save himself um, and just couldn't get any farther than the gas station across the street. It's tragic. So the whole thing is tragic. Uh, Police detective Jason Hardaway says they believe Randon knew both suspects and they allege that the suspects had purchased from him before. So police are alleging that Randon is the dealer in this case. This is what they are alleging. Police noted that this is the first time that they'd ever heard Randon was ever involved in the selling of drugs. They say he was not on their radar, was not known to them. And so as you can imagine, it's all of this is coming out now. And these are allegations. Here's a clip of Randon's mother, Ophelia Nichols doing this video for a reason because i need y'all's help i ain't never asked y'all for anything but i need your help with this there's almost seven million people that follow me somebody's got to know something today would have been my baby child's 19th birthday But he was took from me last night and took from my children and my husband and our family. My son was murdered. He was shot. And I have this hatred in my heart that I don't recognize. Because I've never felt hate for anybody. This individual took my son's life. He was just 18 years old. That's the best part of somebody's life. And I know they're out there in my town. They're out there. Of course, his mother is absolutely heartbroken and she is trying to get justice for her son. A little bit more on Ophelia Nichols. She's in her 40s and according to her TikTok page, she goes by the name Shoe Lover 99 online. She shares funny videos about her daily life and answers questions from her followers who she affectionately calls tater tots and she's called mama tot. 
So as you said, you develop these relationships, and I'm sure many of those folks, especially the ones who live locally, have equally been heartbroken and are trying to assist her at this time. Uh, Detective Hardaway said this, which I find interesting. He said he's very thankful for the outpouring of tips, especially because of Ophelia's reach. And he is very grateful for the support of the local community and beyond. However, he noted this, quote, this homicide is not more important than any other homicide that we've had in the city of Pritchard or actually anywhere. Again, a reminder, a lot of parents don't have this reach. So authorities are still looking for more information. They're not done with their investigation. Then Ophelia had to respond to what the police were saying about her son, as you can imagine, because now you know, sometimes you don't want to grieve publicly because stuff like this could come up. She said, she shared that her son had struggled after the passing of his biological father. She said that the family thought Randon was finally on the right track and seemed to have turned a corner. So it sounds like she's making a reference to some struggles he had. And she and her family have said that they're absolutely shocked to hear that the motivation for this murder is drug related. It's, it's gotta be a lot to, um, first deal with the tragic loss of your son and then to deal with allegations of criminal behavior. Um, so, you know, it, it took a lot for her to open up about what happened. And then, you know, of course, there's always, um, collateral situations that happen because of public, outcries. So, you know, my hat is off to her for sharing publicly because it did help to move the case forward. And like the police said, they would love to have more information on all of the cases because no one case is more important than anybody else's. Um, But you have to be prepared for things like this. And it's truly sad if the allegations are true uh, that this is another drug related homicide that happens, you know, routinely in communities. And, and uh, unfortunately, you know, hopefully the individuals that are responsible will be brought to justice. But this this is, this is normal when you're dealing in that type of business. Yeah, it's sad, right? It's, it's very frightening. And it's very real, the risks. And uh, there are young people dying across this country. And it's, it's been overwhelming. And we wanted to share this case because it was, it was very unique. And it just reminds us again of, um, wherever anyone can help sometimes through social media, we, we can make a little bit of a difference and there are ways to help. So, um, we'll, we'll keep an eye on this case and see if there are any arrests and, and what more information comes of it. It is time for our comment section. These are the crime cases that you all are talking about on social media. Our producer, Will Updike, is here now with the latest on what y'all are talking about. Hey, Will. Hey, hey Anna. Hey, Gerald. How's it going? Hey, Will. What's up? Not much. So this one, uh, we got an interesting one going on here. So this is kind of another TikTok celebrity, but we have a rapper arrested after a jet ski chase uh, with police in Miami. Now, the rapper Spot Him Got Him, he has a popular song called Beatbox. There's a bunch of uh, remixes for it, but it's also kind of a TikTok dance challenge thing. Um, So a little bit of a link there. But basically how this all went down is on Sunday, June 26, a Miami police officer reportedly noticed Spot Him Got Him, whose legal name is Nehemiah Hardin. Uh, He was driving his jet ski in a restricted speed zone and performing S turns close to the anchored boats. Now, the officer reportedly tried to pull Harden over, but the rapper sped away, supposedly after looking directly at the officer. Uh, And as he sped away, he was jet skiing around swimmers and boaters. Now, according to the arrest report, the officer eventually caught up with him and arrested him for this is a quote from the arrest report, wanton disregard for the safety of persons and property boats uh, at a speed or in a manner as to endanger himself 
or others. Now, this isn't the beginning of Spottam Gotham's uh, arrest sort of history here. He was previously on bond for assault with a firearm. Uh, he was also arrested in an Adventura hotel room on his bed for possession of a firearm, reportedly an AK-47. Um, so he does remain in custody. Obviously, these charges are kind of uh, piling up. He is set to appear in court today. However, I, I don't have any information on that at this time. But people kind of had a field day with this one in the comments. So uh, a, an outlet that sometimes reports on crime, Say Cheese, they actually posted a video of this arrest, uh, which we will show for our video viewers. But for our audio viewers, uh, basically, there's a police boat and the alleged suspect here, Spottam got him. He appears to be handcuffed and he is sitting on the deck of a boat. And all you can really see is his head peeking out above the boat as officers kind of tower over him. It looks kind of like a little kid caught in a very embarrassing situation. Uh, so Matthias B said he looks like a child who lost his parents on the beach. Uh, it does a little bit look like these police officers are just trying to get a kid home. He is a younger guy. He's like in his 20s, but has a real baby face, I would say, uh, which you'll see in the mugshot. Paulie G, uh, a lot of people actually had a, a lot of comments about the rapper's name uh, and then being caught so often by police. Paulie G said, so the police spotted him and they got at him, uh, which uh, it appears so. And unfortunately for Spottom Gotham, this was not the first time. Rick D said his name is what police yelled out after he was apprehended, which could be possible. I would love to hear uh, over the radio. Hey, we spotted him. You go get him. Uh, but I, you know, I don't I, I don't know if that was the case. Look, I, I already mentioned the location of where this happened. It was, you know, with Miami police officers. But I'm pretty sure if I was to read you this headline rapper arrested after chase with police on jet ski. If I gave you three guesses as to the state of which it occurred, you could probably get it in the first one. A lot of people had a lot to say about that. Uh, a lot of people also commented on this being like a Grand Theft Auto game. And CT said, <laughs> who needs Grand Theft Auto at this point? We got Florida, uh, which apps. <laughs> apps. Um, and then Professor actually noted something interesting about the boats the police use there in Miami. So th these police officers are used to catching like drug boats that are designed to smuggle. Uh, so he wondered why he thought a jet ski could outrun the police boat, which I wasn't actually aware of that information. It does kind of make sense. But you would think dealing with a lot of sort of uh, port crime that they would have very fast boats. But uh, that's going to do it for today's comment section. Wow. Yeah, he was playing Grand Theft Auto. That's the first thing I thought of when he was, you know, trying to jet ski away from the police. I was like, oh, this is Liberty City all over again. <laughs> would that? Do you think that that would be like a five star wanted on Grand Theft oh, Auto? That's definitely, that's definitely five star. He was definitely five star. And and I thought I heard in one of the reports he had an AK-47 either in this incident or the previous incident, which would definitely take to a five star. Yeah. Yeah. That was in a previous <laughs> incident. I, I don't okay. know if you can, I don't know how you would handle an AK 47 on a jet ski, but I mean, you need I, a strap. On, on you grand need a strap. On grand yeah. theft auto, you can. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Well, very, very invigorating. This was refreshing with <laughs> lots of water splashing. Well, fresh right. air, no death. Uh, yeah. So thanks for having yeah. me this week. All right. Bye. We'll see you next week. See you. Will. That's our podcast for this week. Gerald, thank you so much for joining us. Every time you join us, there's like something huge going on in your life. Last time you were on, you were in between cases and you managed to finish the podcast in a moving vehicle. You weren't driving with your seatbelt on. And yeah. I want you to know this, Gerald, you are the person, the guest by which all other guests are now measured. <laughs> because now when anyone says that they're delayed or they can't make it, we're like, you know what? Gerald can do it in a moving car with a seatbelt on. Why can't you? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I set the standard kind of high. Uh, oh, that's, yeah. that's funny. You're right. It seems that I'm always doing something. But this time I was in my office still waiting on that text message. But, um, you know, I'm always honored to be here with you guys. Looking forward to it. And hopefully, you know, one day we will not have a crime associated with Grand Theft Auto on the podcast <laughs> maybe yeah we got a trend going here all right well gerald as always um we're very grateful for your time you're very busy where can people follow you on social media if they want to know all the amazing things that you're up to on all social media they can follow me at attorney griggs a-t-t-o-r-n-e-y-g-r-i-g-g-s on all platforms instagram twitter youtube um, facebook follow me there 
Um, I'm always in some sort of um, justice like situation, whether that's in court or, or protesting. Uh, so follow me on those channels. And I look forward to coming back on the podcast. Absolutely. Absolutely. You're part of the crime family, as we say here. So it's always a pleasure when you can squeeze in some time for us. You can find me at Anna G News, Anna with one N. And of course, you can find this podcast, all of our podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts. But if you all like to watch, just subscribe to our YouTube channel because we also post there. Uh, you can also subscri- subscribe to our a newsletter at truecrimetaily.com. So I'm your host, Anna Garcia. Until next week, as we always say, don't do crime. <laughs> <laughs>